with more ways to learn and comprehend problem solving rather than just reading it in a book or hearing it from your teacher's mouth. While sure, you still need a mixture of those core ingredients, but a pinch of Chemical X can change your entire perspective. The Daydream, usually defined as a series of pleasant thoughts that distract one's attention from the present. But what if that power of distraction aids in your quest for knowledge, aids in your problem solving, and aids in, well, almost any situation you may be facing. Today, I will try to do the impossible, help create a video to help you understand daydreaming. Pickles Declassified Video Survival Guide. Results may vary. All right, so one of my favorite live action shows growing up was Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide, a wacky show about a couple of middle schoolers trying to navigate these next several years of school as best as they can. Well, Ned goes over the do's and don'ts of it all. The show was an amalgamation of a lot of different things, from teaching you real life tips, for the most part, that actually could help you out with your own school and life experiences, to a pesky weasel that the janitor can't catch. It never focused on being this regular kids dealing with school show. Instead, it opts for a more surreal version of the kids dealing with school, a more daydream-like aspect of the day-in-the-life format. You take equal parts real and grounded as much as possible to our known reality and apply enough fantastical scenarios and situations that culminate in this effect. That staring out of the window while the teacher's talking or overthinking how you would speak to someone you're nervous to speak to at the moment. What a possible version of school these kids are going through rather than just from the lens of the viewer. So knowing that the show focuses focuses on these grander, more out there concepts, you can see clearly how weird the show can end up getting. Whether it's just for a quick visual gag or something funny with the editing, the show was never afraid to play around with how the story could be told. And here's where this all starts tying together, the season one episode, Daydreaming and Jim, an episode literally focusing on the aspect of a kid daydreaming to help them get by whatever situation they are in. Along with that, adding in some surprise cameos that cement this weirder episode of the show into my memory banks. So let's talk about why this episode was weird, why it's still one I think about to this day, and why it brings up a conversation about daydreaming almost perfectly. So the episode starts off with Loomer, the school bully, and his pals messing with Susie Crabgrass when Ned, Cookie, and Moe's come in to save the day in this epic showdown of mid-2000s kids television video editing. And after saving the day, the teacher, Mr. Sweeney, wakes Ned up before he gets to kiss Susie. But if you're a daydreamer like me, Learn from my mistake and don't be too obvious. Teachers hate the staring out the window daydream. Way too obvious. Try your best to stare at an educational item in the front of the class. That way you can cover yourself if you get nailed. So there you go. That's the first tip given about daydreaming and kind of discussing how, well, teachers kind of hate that looking out of the window thing. And that's pretty true. I should know myself in the window play out this symbiotic relationship where the window became the screen and my mind was the projector. Man, what kind of pseudo pretentious writing was that? Back on track, the show started off with a hypothetical situation daydream. A boy crushing on a girl he likes and gets to save her from danger. This is the personal circumstance daydream, a more common daydream when you're not faced with a task at hand, juxtaposed to a later setup in the show we will get to. Mr. Sweeney ends up holding the kids during lunch since they spent all class daydreaming, and their only way out is to answer why the words water, wolf, and trapdoor are written together. And the only hint that is given is that you can find the answer somewhere in the classroom. So what does Ned do best? Well, he daydreams himself as a spy trying to help all the students get out of class to get lunch and eat pizza. Leading into the same example before, except now it's leading into the rising action of the show, the plot not moving beyond this real-time moment. We see Ned use a heightened version of himself and more exaggerated looks of the classmates and teachers around him to fully immerse himself in what's going on. You're stuck with the task. Solve the riddle, free the class, be the hero. Simple. But how do we arrive at that goal? This in his brain puts him outside of the class in his daydream trying to get back inside of the class, not only to just rescue the students from the scenario that's going on as the secret agent, but he has to power through and understand that the answer is in the classroom. And this is how his brain is visualizing trying to understand that. Let's continue to follow. And probably one of the coolest things I've witnessed and was jealous of as a kid was the fact that Ned and Moe's got to drive a sweet new whip through the halls of the school, which they totally aren't really driving and it was being pulled and the hallways were also green screened in to make it show that it was moving a lot from all the front view shots but hey still pretty cool and I'm mad that I wasn't born as Devin Warkheiser. 
We then cut back out of the daydream to hear Mr. Sweeney tell Ned that You will never free the class for lunch by daydreaming. This I feel is important to the show. It's something that resonates with me. Something I was scolded by teachers for growing up as I would daydream in class often, and I'll get back into my own personal connection more later. Now Mr. Sweeney is offering the next hint to help the students in solving the riddle. The answer is in this room, and it spins allowing Ned to take in more context. When I originally stated earlier we still need some guidance of thought to drive the daydream, that still holds true. By paying attention to the key parts and then applying your own mind and how it puts things together, you're able to formulate the bigger picture. Here we get an example of how your brain could work with the example of how Ned's brain's working. He very specifically says, I wish there was a way into that room. And then seemingly out of nowhere, the fairly odd parents, Cosmo and Wanda, show up to help secret agent Ned. This whole whole bit of the mixing of an animated show into a show taking place within a more realistic setting was first weird due to the shock of the surprise cameo, but second, ingenious. So let's break it down. Word association. How does that play out? For example, I say Pokemon. You may think Pikachu. Or if I say skate, you'd probably say board in most cases. Well, let's try this. If I say cat, you might say dog. Whether it's because you associated both as domesticated animals or because you're a nostalgia-driven person fueled by 90s animation. Maybe you respond with fish, maybe due to you're just hungry or possibly your favorite meal because your father used to fish with you when you were young. Would you still arrive at the same answer for different reasons or something completely different due to your own experiences? But let's pull back to what he said. I wish. Then the next moment the fairly odd parents show up. The obvious who wants to be a millionaire answer here is B. Easy word association. Wish. That translated into Cosmo and Wanda. They are fairies and they grant wishes. But to look deeper in this because <laughs> why shouldn't we at this point, we can associate the age of Ned in middle school, the prime age to be watching cartoons on Nickelodeon. Ned most likely watches the fairly odd parents as at the time it was one of the most popular shows from Nickelodeon aside from Spongebob. He clearly knows who they are when referring to them and treats them in his head just like they would act within the cartoon itself. Those context clues can add up and justify that assumption, at least to make it all make sense. Ned's subconsciousness took parts of the real world, the important parts, and combined it with the fantasies within his head, thus allowing the mind to navigate a unique pathway to work through his situation. Alright, let's digest this a bit easier for a bit. He is able to use one wish to help him in his journey in solving this riddle. He chooses to get himself inside of the class room to in a sense face the problem head on to be where the actual answer could come from he then finds out that he could have wished for the answer because he could have wished for anything but this was smart here though it's subtle but well done ned couldn't have got the correct answer even if he wished it because he himself doesn't know the answer the fairies are in his mind using his knowledge they could help him focus on the problem better create pathways to get him closer to the answer but they cannot give him the answer because he and himself does not not know it. We visit the students asking Sweeney for another hint, so he obliged. And you can easily find it on the web. You can easily find it on the web. More word association coming up soon. As Ned visualizes Sweeney as this evil villain, Sweeney sprays a webbing onto Ned, sticking him against the wall. Something maybe a super-powered villain like a Marvel or DC movie would have. Another thing someone Ned's age could definitely heavily be into. The web power based on Ned using the clue given and used association to think of a spider web which doubles as a trap for the secret agent that he could get caught in. It's kind of heavily layered, like an onion. Or an Ned then takes all of these context clues, the words water, wolf, and trap door are related by the words spinning and web and can be found within this classroom. And then it hits him. He looks around the room, sees the different animals, bugs, insects, and arachnids labeled on the wall, and blurts out, I know the answer! He gets everyone's attention, Sweeney at the ready to laugh at whatever guess was coming from his mouth. Ned says this. Those words are together because they're all spiders. And Sweeney responds with. <laughs> That's right. And just like that, he frees the class, gets his My Hero from Susie that he's been always daydreaming about. He leans in for the kiss and is rejected as sometimes the daydreams are nothing more than that. And that's also pretty important to see because sometimes it's not always just going to be there to help or solve anything for you every single time. Sometimes some of your thoughts are just thoughts. They're fantasy. And there's nothing more than that.
but I like how Ned says it best. Daydreaming is more than taking a field trip in your head. It's a way your brain figures out problems and comes up with solutions to stuff. It's how inventors invent, it's how scientists do science, and it's how new ideas are born. And sometimes, daydreams exactly what you need. It's essentially you helping you from a deeper subconscious state. Sometimes it can exactly correlate with something you are dealing with, a way for you to work out something you weren't cognizant of trying to work out. Now let me try and clarify this. Do I think that this episode of the show was written to be this deep? Most likely not. It for sure has more to do with how I perceive this episode and take away from it what I feel it tells me. And who knows, maybe the writers of this episode wrote this under the guise of their own daydreams leading them to writing the script so effectively thought-provoking that even they didn't understand how diligently it was written. But maybe everything I said here was all just a little too deep. I mean, how do you perceive my explanation? Was this all the result of another daydream? The final tip being that yes, a daydream can be exactly what you need to help solve problems or situations you are having to deal with, which is pretty incredible to see that being shown and taught within a kid's show. I swear, all my life I was told daydreaming was detrimental to my learning capabilities, but Ned's Declassified told me that I'm using the power of my mind to come up with the solutions to my situations. I literally would have teachers say all the time, hey, are you even listening? What did I just say? And I would always reply back with exactly what they said or what they were teaching. Teaching. Every time there was a parent-teacher conference that needed to happen, the teacher would tell my parents, yeah, he does know his stuff and he does well on the test, but I never feel he's giving me his full attention. Well, hey, Miss Teacher Lady, sometimes kids learn differently. Some people need to pay attention to learn, some learn better in unconventional ways like daydreaming to help comprehend the task given. It's beautiful, it's creative, and it's something that shouldn't be glossed over as, oh, they aren't paying attention, as that always isn't the case. For some it is, and for some it's not. That's the beauty of the human mind, how the brain works and operates. I appreciate Ned's Declassified for always willing to give relatable tips to its audience and not always sugarcoat everything. Most times they made sure not to just give us the bring an extra pen type tip, they're willing to speak to the kid at the time, the real stuff we were dealing with at school. Like the show even showed you how to deal with rumors and how they can hurt people and how they travel. And while that may not be the most original concept, it's about how they executed it and how well done it was, going for an interesting way way to break the rumor rather than trying to plead the truth because every solution doesn't always just have one way to answer it. Now the second part of the daydreaming episode is called gym and it deals with the trio in gym class when the majority of them are not athletic. It's another fun episode but for sure not weird like daydreaming as well as not the focus of this video. And that's also just to show that in only 11 minutes half of the full show was able to portray daydreaming so beautifully. Overall, Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide was not just a great show, but a goofy one as well. In the best way possible, it crossed into a new and weird way of storytelling for the exact age audience to resonate with, giving those who, like myself, often daydream during school. Not just taking and perceiving the world in front of me, but also the beauty and creativity and how we all understand it. The show understood me, how my brain operates, and offers a look through a third-person perspective. I honestly have so much more to say about this show, about other episodes within the series, I mean, why Why is Fred Savage here? But we'll just leave it at that for today. What are your takeaways from the show with episodes like this? Episodes that allow for a more broader discussion. Let me know all that in the comments down below. Hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the bell next to it to be notified when I upload next. Really quickly, check out my last video. I'm trying to make a real movie with my friend Nerdstalgic. There's a bunch of awesome people on board. Check out that video for way more details. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll catch up with you next time.